So I'd like now to turn to the open lecture for tonight, which is to be delivered by Major General Retired Fergus or Gus uh, McLaughlin AO on the very topical subject of drones, smart munitions, and cyberspace. The 21st century defense of Ukraine and its implications for Australia. Gus tells me he's had a busy day, including just uh, leaving the, uh, the stage of the drum. Gus retired from the Australian Defence Force in 2018. He held several senior appointments in the Army, including responsibility for modernisation and strategic planning. He created the first Army cyber, cyber capability introduced reconnaissance drones and commenced the creation of a deployable digital command and control system. In other words, a military internet of things. Gus's last appointment in the Army was as Commander of Land Forces Command, which comprised 36,000 women and men in roles as diverse as helicopter crews, tank and artillery units, logistics and satellite communications. He saw active service in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq and Afghanistan. Gus now serves in the executive and advisory roles in defence industry, private equity, cyber security and information systems companies. I'm also pleased to introduce Colonel retired Andrew Condon industry professor for veterans and their families at the Australian Catholic University, where he has been for a year. Uh, Andrew will conduct the conversation with Gus after his presentation. Andrew is former CEO of Legacy and chair of RSL Life Care Aged Care. He currently serves on federal government's, on the federal government's Aged Care Advisory Board. So Gus, welcome to the stage, and Andrew, you will follow to, uh, to conduct the inquisition and also to ask for questions from the audience. So welcome, Gus. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I think it's a very um, important topic, and I, I, I think in a well-informed democracy, uh, we need to... Um, you know, take the time to understand what's happening in, in uh, places like Ukraine, which might seem a long way away, but of course, um, with the sort of storm clouds of instability growing over the Asia Pacific region, um, I think the more we understand about the way uh, war is being shaped by technology, the better decisions that we will make. Mark Twain famously said that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And in the late summer of 1943, the largest tank battle in history took place on the plains of Eastern Europe, east of Kyiv, at a place called Kursk. The Russian counterattack uh, uh, against the German invading force was ultimately successful and, and is, uh, to this day is regarded as the largest tank battle in history. It's likely that this summer will echo with tank battles in the same area. And it's through this lens that we need to understand the imminent decisions that people like Olaf Schulz are making as the Chancellor of Germany about the trepidation he feels as a leader of a country deeply scarred by providing uh, German tanks that rumbled across the plains of Europe as he makes decisions about whether to contribute those tanks to the uh, ultimate liberation of Ukraine. We're 12 months into uh, a land war and there are numerous things that, that we are learning about the impact of technology on the war. Um, but sadly, one of the things we're also learning is a whole lot has not changed. So wh what are we seeing? I, I do want to take time. It's important we, we, we talk a little about the impact of, of technology on the war, but I think it's also important we spend a little bit of time on the, on the origins of the conflict. Um, uh, Andrew and I are, are very conscious that the, the experience and wisdom in this audience. We'd love to get into a conversation afterwards, so we'll try and make sure we leave some time, but please um, allow me just to go back over a little bit of time. Olaf Schultz uh, said soon after the Russian invasion that the invasion ultimately ended 40 years of unipolar US leadership. And I think it's important to understand this uh, challenge to the Western system 
um, that, that we have uh, benefited on under so uh, generously with things like global trade, uh, uninterrupted supply chains, and a relatively benign period of US leadership uh, now appears to be over. And Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, you know, he went as far as to say the US wants a unipolar world, not a global village, but a US village. We're not closing the door on the West, they're closing the door on us. And uh, Putin himself, interestingly, 90 minutes late in his address to uh, his nation as a result of hacktivism, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, said that the US believe they represent God on earth. Everything else is a colony or a backyard. The United Nations General Assembly has voted twice to uh, discuss the issue of, uh, of condemning the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, as recently as a, a speech in Canada, the US Secretary of Defence celebrated the fact that of the 193 countries, 141 uh, chose to condemn the Russian invasion and condemn Russian behaviour. Only five countries supported Russia's behaviour, that included countries like North Korea, and, but 35 countries abstained. In that 35 countries was 50% of the world's population. So China, India, Pakistan, Vietnam, South Africa, for example, all chose to abstain on the question of the uh, ultimate morality of the Russian invasion. And I think it's important for us all to understand that this uh, view of the benefit of that 40 years of unipolar US leadership is not universally uh, perceived. So this likely period, this period, second period of globalisation, as it's been called, looks like it's over. There'll be lots of industry analysis around the end of just-in-time supply chains, the move to friendly in time or, or, or to, to, to stock holdings. We'll leave that for another discussion. But through my period of military, professional education and development, we followed kind of two schools of thought. Francis Fukuyama, uh, American academic, who postured uh, that the demise of the Berlin Wall and the, and the end of the Soviet Union represented the end of history, and that the liberal uh, um, democratic world order supported by uh, the, the mechanisms of capitalism meant that, that in real terms uh, history was over. It was inevitable that those things would prevail. Uh, and of course, Sam Huntington, interestingly, Fukuyama's professor, Huntington took a different view, and he said that it is ultimately the case that civilizations will clash. Uh, and, that the, and that the real conflict was still to come. Now, lots of people contest Huntington's uh, division of the of this sort of cultural landscape, and, I, and, and I'm, and, and I'm ex one that accepts that it was far from perfect. But really interestingly, the, the fault line down the eastern side of Ukraine with the Orthodox Christian uh, Russian uh, side on the east and the uh, Catholic uh, uh, European uh, view of Christianity on the west um, has clearly played into Putin's understanding of what would happen when he invaded Ukraine. Putin uh, clearly believed that that fault line would fracture and that the orthodox, uh, predominantly Russian-speaking people in the west of the, sorry, in the east of the country would uh, welcome him with garlands of, of, of flowers and the invading force. And that's clearly not uh, been the case. So again, let's just briefly explore some of the, the background. At the, zooming out to the strategic level, one of my roles in the military, I was seconded to the uh, Pentagon in uh, Washington to work on the first uh, defence policy statement of the Obama administration. Only two countries uh, asked to participate in that uh, activity, the Brits and us, in, in, and it represent a very special relationship we have with our main alliance partner. US presidents are obliged by law to uh, release a policy statement in the first year of their uh, administration, unlike in Australia where governments uh, can choose to release a defence white paper um, when circumstances change. What's really significant in the Biden quadrennial defence review is Biden, the Biden administration admitted for the first time that the US was incapable of winning two wars at once. US defence policy for decades had been that they, as, a, as the main global superpower, were capable of winning two wars at once. And, and understanding that might mean a war in Europe and it might mean uh, a war in the Asia Pacific. Biden admitted what most of us professionals had known for some time, that that was um, um, impossible. In fact, most of us had known that perhaps the Americans could, could hold or support one area of conflict and arguably win in another. 
And it's into that uh, new US uncertainty that Xi and Putin, uh, as, as two uh, leaders who are interested in uh, bifurcation of global systems and of ending this period of unipolar uh, American leadership, have stepped in to exploit that, uh, that challenge. So US policy is, is now largely designed that to the extent they can hold uh, the situation in Europe, uh, enable Ukrainian victory, whilst keeping their eyes on the far more difficult challenge of, a, of an, an emergent and increasingly confident and belligerent China. This bifurcation of global systems has a, has a political and, and a philosophical bent, but it also has a technological bent. The, the Huawei uh, efforts to dominate the uh, rollout of the 5G networks and global internet systems um, is a clear attempt for China to take the lead of those technical systems. We're seeing uh, the, the swift um, uh, mechanisms of global uh, internet payment systems under threat by alternate uh, Chinese pathways and, of course, uh, Chinese challenges to the World Bank uh, and other things. So those leaders uh, who, who challenge this US period of leadership are, are, are fundamentally seeking an alternate uh, uh, organisation. So let's, let's uh, talk a little bit now um, about Ukraine. And the, the, the picture on the screen is really important because I think what we have seen as a result, while Putin had ambitions, and many of which uh, were, were imperialist ambitions that dated back to uh, 12th century uh, uh, Russian um, myth making perhaps, um, he chose to take uh, to pick a fight with a genuine 21st century leader. My argument is that we are we are seeing a war between a 20th century uh, leadership construct in Russia and a 21st century uh, leadership construct in um, in Ukraine. Putin. Uh, uh, commenced what he called a special military operation without mobilisation. And, and again, for people uh, like Andrew and I, there were clear uh, indications in that about uh, Putin's understanding and, and, our, and ambition. Mobilised about 290,000 troops, postured them in the snow uh, in the borders of Ukraine, and it was pretty clear that he intended to invade. That's about 65% of the Russian standing army, meaning that's a one-shot uh, opportunity. There's no spare army with which to rotate uh, those forces. There wasn't at the time. Military planners do a, do a, a, a basic um, sort of set of, of what we call mathematics force ratios. When you look, when I looked at someone like, with, with, you know, something close to 200,000 uh, 200, uh, troops on the border, we knew that the Ukrainians actually were capable of, of fielding an army of about 200,000 people. It was pretty clear to military professionals that despite um, what we perceived as, as uh, Russian uh, technological and, and perhaps uh, professional advantage, it didn't have the force to overrun uh, all of Ukraine. Now, Putin and his advisers, and in particular his advisers, may have been telling him that there was this likely to be this social collapse uh, garlands thrown in front of soldiers as they marched on Kyiv, but the reality of the force ratios and the mechanics of the war that he faced was, was unlikely that he would be successful. And I uh, sadly said in forums like this almost a year ago, um, while well, some commentators were saying the war would be over in three weeks, um, my response was we'll still be talking about this at, at Christmas, meaning in Christmas 2022. Well, sadly, I'm now going to say to you tonight, tonight, I think we're still going to be talking about this at Christmas in 2023. I think we're entering possibly the most dangerous phase of the war, and I can talk about that in, in, in a little bit. Broadly, there's been three phases of, uh, of the war so far, what I'd call the, the battle for Kyiv, which, which was almost immediately unsuccessful. We had this Russian uh, withdrawal and reversion to a phase I call fire and, and movement. They would bombard a, a, a thousand metres in front of their troops for 24 hours and they would advance a kilometre, uh, destroying infrastructure, um, homes, people and troops as they went. Uh, and that was a dangerous and difficult period for the Ukrainians because they, even though their soldiers were better trained, um, they lacked the ability to, to reach uh, Russian uh, artillery and Russian logistics uh, and we're in, were in a dire position. Um, fortunately for them, the West responded, and we'll talk a bit more about how the West responded in terms of providing equipment and support. 
The next phase of the war I call the Ukrainian uh, local counterattacks, and, and we saw a very significant uh, counterattack in the summer that uh, removed the Russians from uh, you know, probably 10 or 15 per cent of territory. And in my opinion, that uh, gave Zelensky the time uh, to, to pursue all-out defeat of the Russians, because I think prior to that success, it was likely that people like the French President and the German Chancellor were starting to manoeuvre towards um, uh, negotiations with the Russians over a, over a uh, negotiated settlement. The barbarity of the Russian attacks became clear in this period. We had uh, atrocities committed in villages before which they withdrew, um, and we had very significant attacks on infrastructure uh, which continue. The fourth phase um, is, is what we are building towards now, and, and that's what I'd call the strategic counterattack, where the Ukrainians are seeking to build up the capacity to actually evict the, the Russians from their country. Now, those force ratios that I talked about before, simple, broad um, military planning mathematics, a defender is expected to be able to stop probably three to five attackers. When you think about the defender's advantage, they are on home ground, they've probably had a chance to prepare defences to dig in and get below ground, they're resupplies on, on what's called interior lines, and so it's generally expected that a, that a, that a defender will, will be able to stop a greater number of attackers. And that's what we saw with the professional performance of the, of the Ukrainian uh, army under considerable threat. They were able to force, uh, ultimately cause the Russians to grind to a halt. But of course the polarity of that force ratio now reverses and we have a situation where if the Ukrainians are to evict the Russians from their country, they're going to need at least to be able to generate local advantage of three to five uh, times the troops that are available on the other side, which is going to be very difficult, which of course leads to the discussion around systems like uh, the provision of tanks and other things, which, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, I therefore anticipate we're going to see a very dangerous and dramatic uh, period where uh, we're seeing counterattacks from uh, the Russians now led by this Wagner group of mercenaries who are throwing uh, conscripted young soldiers uh, into a fight. 200,000 young Russians have been mobilised um, with very little training. They are literally just being forced into uh, advances. And uh, it's highly likely there are Wagner soldiers at the back of their formation threatening to shoot them from behind if they turn around and run away and they'll be telling them that at least you've got some chance of living if you continue to attack. So we're in a very uh, brutal um, uh, period. Zelensky, uh, 21st century leader, he's agile, he knows how to communicate. Everyone knows that he was a former uh, media uh, comedian. Um, interestingly, he's more on the chaser style of comedian, so politically aware, smart, sharp, savvy, um, it, it topped his law school at, at university. Um, probably argue that he wasn't being a particularly successful peacetime leader, a difficult country to govern, lots of uh, endemic corruption, but uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And what we've seen is a leader who is capable of um, a level of sophistication in modern communication that I don't think we've seen before. Um, I think we will look back at him as almost a Churchillian level figure in terms of his ability and his ability to mobilise uh, support for his country. His communications, agile, multi-platform, multimedia, tailored to the audience, TikTok, sound bites, short, sharp, penetrating uh, commentary, um, where his adversary is giving 90-minute rambling speeches uh, on traditional platforms that, that nobody is listening to. Zelensky knew he had to preserve the information networks of his country in order to get th th those messages out. So they, they knew the Russian invasion was coming. Cyber defence was planned ahead. Uh, data was, was offshored into, into global um, uh, uh, cloud capacity. Applications that for, for running their government were offshored into, into global cloud capability. They mobilised the agencies of the West to help them prepare their cyber defences. So um, the NSA in the US, GCHQ, in the UK and, and the Australian Signals Directorate. And you recall uh, Prime Minister Morrison at the time saying that we would provide cyber support. What he was talking about was this uh, support to help keep alive this communications layer uh, in uh, Ukraine. Um, I'm an adjunct professor down at, at Monash University. There's a wonderful uh, uh, 
uh, institution there, part of uh, which is for social purpose, um, called the Internet Observatory. Um, Internet Observatory monitors internet performance for uh, evidence of state-sponsored uh, reduction, and they, they they tracked the Ukrainian internet performance throughout this period. And they the, the, about the lowest uh, the level of function that the Ukrainian internet and communications architecture was degraded to was about 85 per cent of capacity, which was a remarkable achievement, uh, you know, given the, the, the effectively former superpower worth of capacity that was thrown at them. Um, that fight is not over, by the way, uh, and, and, and we're seeing a significant rallying of, of Russian capacity, including um, uh, trying to strike at uh, uh, those agencies and companies and countries that have supported Ukraine. So uh, there's, there's likely some attention for Australia uh, in that uh, process. But through this period, uh, Zelensky was able to, uh, ultimately his critical vulnerability is Western attention and Western engagement, which, which leads to material support for his army. Um, and he's been able to remarkably keep uh, the West aligned with that uh, process. This, um, this map is a, a, a very current representation of the state of play on the ground. Um, interestingly, um, it's, it's from an, an organisation called the Institute for Study uh, of War, and it's, which is one of a number of organisations that are providing an outstanding level of analysis um, on, on what is happening on the war and, and, and are providing a platform for uh, a fairly clear understanding for people like me to, to be able to follow the conflict in a way that is really quite remarkable. It is empowered by a new level of open source intelligence um, mm. that is unprecedented. I think I know more about what's going on in the ground in Ukraine than I did when I was a general on the ground in Afghanistan. Now, you think about that, that's not that long ago, but the level of pervasive, um, you know, hand-based phone imagery coverage, right down to the cheap Chinese tyres on the logistic convoys that are bursting in the snow and causing these backlogs of, of Russian convoys that can then be attacked. Uh, we're seeing uh, drone footage and, and disposition maps with a level of granularity that is really quite uh, extraordinary. So this, you, you'll hear the term OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. Now we've got to be careful because it's not analysis, it's information, and it's being, mis it's being manipulated, in this case we think by the good guys. So, so Zelensky is being very careful to make sure there's free access to this sort of imagery uh, giving a positive depiction of what the Ukrainians are facing. Um, sadly, uh, he necessarily has to restrict our understanding of how many casualties the Ukrainian forces are taking, which has been very, very significant. So it, it, it is not really intelligence, but it is certainly unprecedented information. And the UK head of GCHQ, the, the, the British Cyber Intelligence Agency, Jeremy Fleming, in a visit to Australia last year, said, in his opinion, the pace of declassification of the information provided by the intelligence agencies is unprecedented, and it's being picked up by organisations like this uh, and promulgated in a way that, 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 that all of us, people like me, can consume. Um, uh, Fleming goes on to say, which I think is really significant, um, intelligence is only worth collecting if it's used. And, and in this case, it's being used to preempt uh, Russian action. So if we are reporting that it's likely the Russians are going to try and create a dirty bomb from the former Chernobyl uh, nuclear facility um, with credible intelligence, it provides a significant disincentive for the uh, Ukrainians to, um, to, 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 to do so. Very other, another significant element of this, uh, these layers of support, so we've talked about um, you know, state-sponsored agencies, the, 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 the cyber agencies of the Five Eyes countries. Um, but we've also had this, this uh, exciting emergence of a thing I call hacktivism. And so the white hat hackers of, of the world, many of whom work in, in banks for intrusion detection, uh, um, um, you know, test uh, code, etc., have rallied behind this cause in a way that we haven't seen before. And Putin's speech that I described as being delayed for 90 minutes uh, was, was not delayed by, by Western intelligence agencies, but was delayed by white hat hackers uh, who wanted to make uh, a mockery of Putin and their ability to defend uh, his network. So let's talk about the cyber dimension um, in, in, in a little bit more detail. 
We expected cyber attacks from the Russians. When we studied the Russian invasion of Georgia, we saw prior to Russian troops going across the border, um, things like the, uh, the telco networks being pulled down, uh, traffic signals, uh, uh, power and distribution, uh, even, the, even the functioning of hospitals, all disabled in cyberspace before physical troops came across the border. And as I said, in, in this case, uh, there was significant uh, anticipation of that uh, by the, the Ukrainian government. The, the other piece I didn't talk about, uh, so we've talked already about the state-based agencies, we've talked about hacktivism. We've seen industry stepping up in a way that is uh, also quite remarkable, that is picking sides. Microsoft, uh, as an example, has done an extraordinary role uh, uh, working with the Ukrainian government to preserve the functioning of their government. They set up a cyber operations centre that specifically watches Ukraine. They are seeing the attacks the Russians are making, rapidly deploying patches uh, that, 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 that remove those vulnerabilities in real time from the Ukrainian government agencies. Now, when you're a country that's trying to deal with um, up to four million displaced civilians, uh, tracking where your citizens are, understanding the, the, the attacks to your infrastructure, you can imagine how critically important that um, has been. Russia and China have proven to be quite adept at offensive cyber, that is the ability to steal intellectual property to disrupt. I don't think they anticipated the need to establish their own defences, uh, and so they've proven to be quite vulnerable to uh, the offensive cyber activities that, that, that have followed them. I'm going to put, it, put the group on the spot. Can anybody identify the device at the front of that photo? It's a Starlink terminal. So um, Starlink is a, a system of low orbit Earth satellites uh, launched by Elon Musk. Uh, I think at the time this photo was taken, there were probably 2,000 satellites in that orbit. I think it's going to grow to about 8,000 over time. Um, Musk donated, uh, or at least made available, I think the Ukrainians are probably paying for it, or the American government is through, the, on behalf of the Ukrainian government, but made available uh, these terminals so that the functioning of the Ukrainian government could continue. And I'm going to talk about their military use. The significance of this photo, this is a passport, passport issuing checkpoint at the Kyiv railway station. Four million people displaced, leaving to go outside the country, travel all over the world, uh, many of whom had never left the country, didn't have passports. And without connectivity like this, to the internet and the ability to process those, this would simply have been a, sh you know, just would have been a shambles. Um, so uh, a, a, an interesting example of uh, what Starlink was able to provide. Now, um, I'll, I'll give you an example of militarily how significant it's been for, for Ukrainian forces. Um, while the 85% uh, of the communications infrastructure of, of Ukraine has been maintained, out in the field where the military are, there's very little infrastructure and communication would have been incredibly difficult. And in fact, the Russians have been enormously challenged by the rangers that they've dealt with, interestingly, which is why their generals have been taking out their mobile phones trying to resolve issues. Um, three-letter agencies in the United States, like the National Security Agency, provide the location of that mobile phone to a rocket forces of Ukraine, and five or six uh, Russian generals were killed quite quickly. So picking up your mobile phone out at the front line for Ukrainian forces was not the option. The provision of these Starlink terminals down at the front line, very close to the com combat force, has been an, um, a specific example of where technology has enabled this 21st century force in the face of this brutal 20th century adversary. And I'll give you a, an example. Um, through Starlink, they've been able to create a digital uh, mesh, uh, internet of things, if you like. Um, and that, that's a useful uh, forum for providing information. In our military, we then put a layer of, of protected command and control systems in there. Uh, we put all sorts of checks and balances and layers and approvals in, in that system. Ukraine um, is a very technically savvy uh, population and workforce. What they uh, did with, with Starlink, drone forces, and I'll, I'll talk more about them in a minute, were out on the front line, identify uh, where a Russian artillery piece was bombarding through this what I called fire and manoeuvre phase. They would post the location of that artillery unit on effectively an Uber-like platform through Starlink and just 
just literally said, we have seen artillery at the following location. Over on the other side, we had the artillery fires from Ukraine effectively shopping on that menu of targets with immediacy, able to just select a target, no approval and mechanisms. In Australia, we'd have five generals, about eight colonels, 28 captains and, and, and you know, 15 other people get in the way. With no layers in between, those um, Ukrainian artillery units have responded to the, to the target of opportunity. Now, what that means is whenever uh, an, an, an artillery unit stops to shoot, between three and five minutes later, uh, counter fires were landing where they were standing. That's, again, unprecedented uh, in warfare. So you, you, you create this moment where the Russians can shoot a few rounds, have to pack up their guns and go. They call it shoot and scoop. Well, the reason it, they're having to do that within three to five minutes because of this amazing adaption of Ukrainian forces um, and, and utilising the, the Starlink technology. Uh, Putin's had a number of attempts to disrupt the, the Starlink uh, frequency, so it, you know, ultimately it's a radio signal uh, to space, but because it is relatively low Earth and because it is a direct line of sight, it's proving to be a very difficult thing to disrupt, whereas a broader-based uh, command and control system that hops through a series of radios on the ground can ultimately be disrupted by electronic warfare uh, capability. So we touched on these uh, soldiers. I, you know, this is you know, my, my kind of image at the start was a trench, not unlike we saw in World War I. And I guess this is 21st century. So these are soldiers, many of them militia. So many of them, uh, you know, U Ukrainian teachers, professors, engineers, bus drivers, um, it, it now in this force. Hovering over them is a commercially available um, drone. I think probably a DJI, uh, a, a Chinese made drone. Um, and a Toyota Hilux. Their ability to, um, to, to, to infiltrate the front line, use that drone to spot uh, 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 Russian movement and then post that kind of information onto the, uh, the command and control system is quite extraordinary. Sounds wildly exciting and exotic, incredibly dangerous um, operation. Again, the Russians are adapting. These drones can be heard. Um, you know, these forces have, uh, are, are enormously vulnerable when the, when the drone is in the air. And in fact, you know, often uh, the Russians will try and follow the drone back to where it lands, um, you know, to be picked up as a, as a Toyota Hilux races off uh, into the distance. This is at the bottom end of this drone uh, war. At the top end of the drone war, we've, we've, we've learned about a, 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 an adaption, a Turkish uh, uh, Bayraktar uh, drone, fascinating story in its own right. Again, for us, um, you know, with our with our Western focus, uh, I confess I had not uh, heard of this um, uh, this capability. But around the world, it has been involved in more than 800 strikes in wars from North Africa to the Caucasus. Um, it's very capable of, of destroying sophisticated systems like air defence, electronic warfare, radars, and tanks. And in this case. The, the Ukrainians have bought uh, from this Turkish company these uh, drones. They're actually a much cheaper version of the Predator drone that Western forces used in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Bayraktar is a fascinating business. Um, in Turkey, they regard him as the, as the Turkish Elon Musk, two million Twitter followers, a celebrity in his own right. And, and again, for that part of the global population who are not particularly enamoured by um, you know, Western advanced technology and the ability to strike with impunity um, anywhere around the world. Um, this this fellow and his and his technology is regarded as something of a of a uh, uh, a Robin Hood like uh, figure. It responds ultimately to U.S. predator strikes. Fortunately for the U Ukrainians, the 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 Bayraktar TB2 has has been in their infantry uh, and not the other side. Um, the Russians. Uh, um, have ad ad similarly adopted an imported drone. We've heard of it, uh, the Shahid drone or the Mata drone. It's ultimately an attack uh, or suicide drone, quite unsophisticated, um, you know, small petrol motor, no camera, GPS location programmed in, effectively flies itself onto a target, relatively accurate, um, but, but in real terms is a terror weapon and it's a weapon to suppress the uh, Ukrainian population. Um, has been quite effective, unfortunately, at, at bringing down the Ukrainian power generation system, which is predominantly Soviet-era 
equipment and therefore replacement parts, etc., are very difficult. So it's a, it's, a, it's a strategic play that the Russians are about using their um, uh, technology. I, I'm going to skip ahead because um, we've got a, a lot to talk about. This image, um, these are drone racing drones. Now, if you're not aware of drone racing, it's the hottest sport for um, young people with incredible reflexes, uh, unlike me. They put a, a 3D um, visor on and they literally fly as if they're on these drones through gates and round targets and, uh, and, and under buildings. Well, here's the adaption. A, um, uh, a sometimes a 3D printed uh, generator, in this case cable ties, uh, and they are flying these uh, bombs you know, down literally into the windows of vehicles and buildings. Those warheads are from a rocket pro propelled grenade called the RPG-7, which is one of the most ubiquitous weapons on the planet. So instead of a soldier having to stand there and run at the, the tank and shoot their RPG-7, the 21st century warrior straps it to a, a racing drone uh, and, and flies it in through the window. The, this, the uh, American, predominantly American support, because the American support is uh, significantly outweighs that of, of other countries, but Australia is, is, I think, in the top 10 countries providing support. Um, you know, uh, Lloyd Austin, the US Secretary of Defence, has, has called it standing against the global politics of fear and coercion, meaning if we allow might is right to return to the preeminent position of how human beings resolve uh, their differences, then, then the global-based order that has, has led to a relatively peaceful planet since World War II will be completely undermined. Um, and the Americans understand their amazing privilege of being able to fight the Russians through the population of, and the people of, of Ukraine. And it will be very interesting to see if, uh, under the new um, Congress, whether uh, there, there are people uh, unwise enough to start to withdraw American support, given this incredible privilege of fighting through the resolve and resilience of, um, of other people, all they want is the means to do so. Um, the weapon system on display there is the Javelin. Javelin missiles have become part of the language of, of all of us now in the West. Uh, in a technology sense, this is an extraordinary uh, missile. It's now been around for a little while. It has a, a, a seeker head that is um, ultimately AI or machine assistance enabled. So the, the soldier whose knees are shaking as the Russian tanks are coming towards them just has to put the, the, uh, the image on the tank. The, the, the seeker head then recognises it as a tank. The soldier can fire the missile and it's called fire and forget. They can then escape back into uh, you know, a hole in the ground or, or, or into a, uh, a ravine behind and then the missile is on its way. Now tank designers have known about missiles for a while so they put all the heavy armour in the front of the vehicle as it advances forward. Javelin says, I know your tricks, uh, thank you, and it pops itself up uh, and, then, and then flies down through the, the thinly skinned roof of the vehicle. Quite an extraordinary system. Uh, some 86% um, of missiles fired have hit their target, which, which again is an extraordinary um, level of success. Now the reality though for us in the Western Alliance is about 40,000 of these missiles have been made Production has stopped. Um, about half of global available stocks, those not fired in training, um, have been consumed in the war in Ukraine. And it's interesting, there's been a subtle shift of American support away from systems like the Javelin and into things like artillery, and that's because they're running out. And I mentioned that their, their, their prospect of two conflicts that they had to deal with, one might be in the Asia Pacific. So we've seen a quiet uh, sort of shift away from the provision um, of the Javelin, but a remarkable missile. Other uh, systems, the Stinger is a similar, similarly capable missile for firing at aircraft, which is the reason the Russians haven't been able to achieve complete superiority uh, over the Ukraine Air Force. Uh, and then, of course, we saw uh, another uh, system enter our language. Um, you know, who knew that Australians would know what a HIMARS uh, system was? It's a high mobility artillery rocket system. This is the, the, probably the game changer that allowed that shift that ended that period of um, fire and movement in which we saw that barbaric uh, crushing behaviour of the, of the Soviets um, or the Russians with former Soviet artillery and stock holdings. Um, this uh, system is, uh, has been able to strike at Russian logistics 
and artillery systems, and we've seen more than 50% drop off in the amount of um, artillery that the Russians have been able to fire back in return. Very significant uh, um, that, that the range is 45 kilometres and the Americans have made very clear to the Ukrainians that it is fired inside the borders of Ukraine only. Um, and this is all about the fear of, uh, of, of escalation and potential nuclear retaliation. Um, there is a longer range version of this missile that, that will reach up to 500 kilometres. Um, you can imagine how much the Ukrainians would like to get hold of that. Uh, that would allow them to strike deep into Russia when things like uh, trains full of, uh, of artillery, ammunition uh, or logistic resupply are moving forward. For now, the, the uh, Americans have, have uh, constrained the conflict into the, the, uh, the, the country of Ukraine itself. And, and I'll just finish on the, on the, on the, the Germans. So um, the, the, uh, if, you, if you'd listened to the narrative about a year ago, uh, the, the tank was finished in, in, in the history of, of warfare. 3,000 odd Russian tanks have been destroyed, a pretty damning indictment on the weapon system and it's probably reasonable to assume that its days in modern warfare were over. So why is it that the Ukrainians are so desperate to get hold of um, Russian, oh, sorry, of, of Western tanks. Of that 3,000, we know about half of them were abandoned by poor conscripts who had no interest in dying uh, in, in the face of a javelin missile, parked it beside the road, popped out the hatch and took off. Um, we saw images of Ukrainian with their farm tractors, uh, you know, stealing those, uh, those vehicles. But about 1,500 were destroyed by systems like the javelin. A tank employed poorly is a very vulnerable uh, uh, weapon system, and, 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 and that is the case. But a tank like the three on the screen, employed within a well-trained army like the Ukrainians are, is absolutely critical to achieve that combat power ratio advantage that I talked about. As they go into offence, if they can't achieve three to one uh, a, a numerical advantage, well, then you have to bring technology and the systems to bear to do so. So they're asking the West for any one of these three, thank you, they're saying to the West, um, on, on, on your left, uh, top left is the British Challenger, top right the German Leopard 2, uh, and the one at the front, my favourite, the Abrams tank, because that's what we use. But actually, the most important tank on that, door, on that uh, image there is the German Leopard 2. Now, the Germans have only offered, I think, 14 of these uh, to go to Ukraine. Relatively small number will make not much difference. But most importantly, that has allowed other countries that use the German Leopard 2 to, uh, to forward it uh, into the conflict. In, in arms procurement, the seller uh, has a significant say over where the weapon is used because they won't supply spare parts or systems. The Germans up until now have been telling countries like Poland who operate the the Leopard 2, no, we won't agree to you um, uh, forwarding it into Ukraine. Again, on the, on the assumption that this would lead to a level of escalation that potentially would, would cause uh, the Russians to retaliate. But I think at the heart of it is that echo of history. Olaf Schultz and the population of Germany do not want to see masses of German tanks advancing across the plains of Europe again. And I can understand exactly why they would feel that way. Um, but, in, but in this case, um, I think they've, they've relented, but, but, with, but with some uh, discomfort. Those Western tanks have all sorts of embedded technology. They have a laminated layers of armour that are designed to uh, more efficiently dissipate uh, penetrating projectiles, uh, have very advanced night fighting uh, capabilities based on thermal images. They have advanced ballistic computers that allow them to shoot on the move with, with very high levels of accuracy. And increasingly, they include countermeasures and systems that will stop an incoming missile by, by firing out a blast of, of, um, uh, of, of molten uh, metal. So very significantly overmatch the Russian capability. So look, in conclusion, because I, I know there's probably lots of questions. Uh, I know Andrew's got plenty for me, so I'm, I've got to be on my toes. I think, sadly, we, this, this war has a long way to run. We're entering a very dangerous period. We in the West have to maintain our support. Um, the, the Ukrainian people, population and military have demonstrated their resilience and resolve. We need to maintain ours. Um, this period of Russian mobilisation is yet to be tested. I think uh, many thousand young Russians are going to be killed in this next phase as they push these poorly trained conscripts in human wave attacks. 
Um, we've seen them dig trenches that look exactly like the trenches uh, that were in Western Europe in World War II. Um, and, and the danger for the people of Ukraine is, is not necessarily the Russians, it's us with our uh, ongoing confidence and resolve. So with that, I think I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions and discussion on many of those elements. Well, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Condon. I'm an industry professor at ACU, was introduced uh, by Susan. Um, can I begin first by uh, acknowledging the Royal Society of New South Wales for taking on this subject? Uh, as confronting as it is, uh, it's important that we have this conversation, that we're informed uh, and that we inquire. Uh, and and that, that being informed and inquiring speaks to the mantra of, of the society uh, itself. Uh, how this is going to work, I'm just going to uh, put a few more questions uh, to Gus. Uh, just to draw out uh, a few more points, you know, he's covered a lot in that period. Uh, I think there's a couple of things we can, we can uh, come back to, uh, and then I will open it up to um, questions uh, from the floor. Uh, in, in the interests of, uh, of full transparency, I have known Gus for a long time. We, uh, we joined the Army on the same day. Uh, our paths, military paths, crossed uh, many times. Uh, in 2004 on the tarmac in Baghdad as uh, I arrived on a C-130 Hercules uh, to start a six-month tour. Uh, I was greeted by Gus. We said hello quickly, shook my hand and then got on the plane uh, to leave from his six-month tour. I think I nearly knocked you over in my desire to get on the plane. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, you know, I uh, value what um, Gus's contribution here tonight and in other forums because he, uh, he is a, a practitioner in this space. Uh, this is a space that is often occupied by what I broadly call the commentariat, uh, and uh, we often don't actually hear from the practitioner. We'll, we'll hear from uh, people who come out of the, the journalist space, the academic space, industry space, political space, but very uh, rarely do we um, hear such an articulate um, practitioner. So I think we've been quite privileged uh, here tonight to what we've heard. Uh, he's, he's covered a lot uh, in, in, uh, in a very short time, uh, so uh, I, I, I think uh, I just wanted to dwell quickly on why it's important um, that we cover this subject. We live in a global world, we're, we're part of the global village, uh, we have a, a war in Europe, or well, certainly that's what the Europeans call it, they, they believe, you know, it depends who you talk to over there, but they, they'll tell you Europe is at war. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, really deal with that and what the implications are uh, for us here uh, as, as a member of, of the Global Village. Um, Gus, if I can uh, go to you now, uh, you, you talked early about we're entering, I think you called it the fourth phase, the, the, the counter-offensive phase, and you said it was the most dangerous. Can you just take us through um, why you think it's the most dangerous, what the risks are, uh, and perhaps some of the things that you know, we should be keeping an eye out on. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. The, the, the Russians have used the winter. Um, and interestingly, the Russians have a term, they call it general winter. General winter has saved them a number of times. General winter stopped Napoleon's advance, stopped Hitler's advance, and the Russians uh, feel that, that, that the winter is their friend. Um, in this particular case, the Ukrainians are as adept at the winter as they are, and in fact have been equipped with 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 much better cold weather equipment and and um, a technology. And I'm sure they are they've come through the winter better than their Russian colleagues. But the Russians have used that period to dig um, very highly developed uh, tre trenches and defensive systems. Now history shows that things like the Maginot Line, um, which have been very highly developed systems, are far from uh, uh, impervious. Um, but they do make the calculus for the Ukrainians much harder. So breaking through a trench system, uh, you know, finding a way through that uh, defensive work and then, and then penetrating deep to, to liberate more territory is much harder than it would be if those trenches were not there. So significant defensive works. And the other thing is the simple reality of 200,000 conscripts that, that, are, that are refreshing. Um, over the course of uh, the first year, it's highly likely the Russians have had over 45,000 casualties. Now, just think about that. We had 41 young men killed in Afghanistan. Um, as a leader, 
you know, I buried three of those boys, uh, you know, standing next to their mum and dad, and it was heart-wrenching. 45,000 young Russians have been killed. Interestingly, Putin rejected the first Ukrainian offer to repatriate bodies. Why did he do that? He didn't want the Russian population to know how many of their young men had been killed. So th those 200,000, whether we like it or not, mass matters, and so we're going to see um, them uh, enter the fray. And I still am concerned um, about this sort of Western approach that is giving them just enough to be more successful than the Russians. Uh, I understand why that is the case. There's a great fear of um, escalation to nuclear weapons. We haven't talked much about that tonight. but So I understand that fear, but I think the reality is um, we need to enable them to be successful as quickly as we can if we want you know, war to be, to be over. Yeah, and so you said dangerous from the point of view that Ukrainians are going to have to be uh, much bolder in terms of going on an offensive uh, because potentially time is running out. Uh, and uh, big difference between um, defence and offence. Um, tell us about the challenges around the offence, particularly when they've now collected, uh, through the generosity of uh, other nations, such a diverse group of, of offensive weapons. Yeah, in a perfect world, you would never have um, three different countries' tanks operating in your military, three different spare parts systems, um, three different training methodologies and supply chains. Um, they are relatively similar, uh, those systems, but, but it was, it's far from ideal. Um, I think what the Ukrainians will do is they will identify, uh, you know, a, a brigade that deals with nothing but American systems and technologies. They might have another brigade that deals exclusively with German technology in the fullness of time as they professionalise in the years ahead. You know, they will remove a lot of this equipment and, and, and pick... Um, one particular um, way to go ahead, and that's why I actually favour the Leopard from Germany. 3,000 Leopards have been produced. It's the most widely tanked by Euro used by European nations. That's the one that is ultimately most likely to be the system that they would adopt. That's very difficult. Offence is harder for a range of reasons. In, in defence, you can, you can largely be stationary, controlling anything, kids, dogs, people, a lot easier when they sit still. Uh, in offence, you have to move, and you have to pick up and move, and generally the opposition's trying to do uh, things to harm you, so coordinating a, an advancing army is much harder, keeping logistics up to it. Andrew was a logistics officer, I was a tank officer. I broke them and he fixed them. Um, and, and that's much harder, as you know, uh, you know keeping the, the fuel up to an advancing army. So I think the Ukrainians are actually professionally capable of all that, um, noting that you don't... You, the Russians are not... Uh, they have performed very, very poorly. So they're a third-rate army. You just got to be better than third-rate, and the Ukrainians are significantly better than third-rate. So, I'm, so I'm optimistic, but but it will be bloody difficult and grinding. I, I, you know, I don't want to. You know, Andrew generously, you know, describe me as a practitioner. What I don't want to do is sort of have you all have to understand and live what it's being like sitting under an artillery barrage for 24 hours. Um, I, have, I have not done that. These Ukrainian soldiers at the moment are sitting under a 24-hour barrage of, of Russian artillery fire. If they, if they move or put their head above a parapet, you know, um, huge chunks of metal are flying around um, the battlefield. And so picking yourself up, moving forward through all that is, is an incredibly demanding thing to, to ask soldiers to do. So um, for all those reasons, um, you know, I, I am um, very apprehensive about what's still to come. Yeah, OK, so big big risks there for the Ukrainians. Uh, clearly, leadership is going to play a big factor, and you talked a little bit about um, leadership. Uh, you know, we've got some big leaders in this game. Uh, you know, Putin, who you know, had brought this whole thing on. Uh, Zelensky, and I'll come back to him, uh, because he's been able to hold off uh, the Russians by keeping the nation together. Uh, you've got uh, Biden, you've got European leaders, you've got Xi Jinping. There's a lot of people playing um, in this space, even though the conflict is sort of limited uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so um, the, the point I'd, I'm just keen to uh, get you to focus on, though, is that the real impact that Zelensky is having at potentially at the troop level, and if you perhaps take us through 
you know, what we understand and know about, you know, the value of, of, of leadership and its effect on morale uh, as, as a, potentially as a force multiplier? Yeah, great question. In, 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 in military thinking, we, we say the moral is to the physical, three is to one. So leadership and morale are three times as important as a new weapon system uh, or, or additional troops. And I think that's been clear. Zelensky's leadership, uh, but cascading through a very, very professional uh, senior military leadership, um, has been significant. And so if the soldiers believe their leaders are authentic, real, willing to share their risks and are very good at their job, they'll generally follow orders and keep doing what they need to do. On the Russian side, the Russian soldiers know their leadership, don't care about them. There's often troops behind them, you know, willing to shoot them in the back if they don't advance. Um, and so that moral is to physical plays um, opposite them. And, and my, my only hope for what might happen is that the Russian military might, uh, morale might collapse as it did in 1917 when, when, when the Russian military ultimately rejected uh, the Tsarist leadership and, 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 what, and brought on the, the Russian revolution. Um, I, I, I don't anticipate that it'll be quite as dramatic as that, but it is entirely possible that whole battalions of Russian troops will simply refuse to fight, and that, that may percolate quite quickly back to Russia, and that's probably the only thing in my mind that could lead to them turning on, on Putin. We haven't talked about the Ukrainian military leadership. It's, it's been quite extraordinary. I'll give you one anecdote. Um, I don't know, we, you know, we probably haven't followed it as closely as me, but there was a period there where Zelensky was saying publicly in Ukraine and through all this media commentary that he does and all his meetings with, with foreign leaders, I have told my troops that they are to focus on the South. I want the, I want the, the, the Russian um, uh, uh, troops that, are, that have crossed the Dnieper River, they are to be removed at all costs. I have told my troops to do that. Now, I remember thinking at the time, it's a bit unusual that he's been that explicit because that gives the, the Russians an indication of his intent. And we actually saw Russian troops moving toward the reinforce that enclave. That was part of a strategic level deception. The counterstroke occurred hundreds of kilometres away in the east. So they have a level of cooperation between the things the president's saying and what the military leadership are asking him to help with, with uh, you know, around deception that is incredibly heartening to see. And, and again, we're just not seeing that the other side. Putin is just whipping them, you know, telling them they can't withdraw. You, you know, all of those things which, which you know, Hitler did uh, in World War II made, made the, the, the ability for his generals to do their job incredibly difficult. So again, I, I think we've got 21st century modern, authentic leader willing to share the risks and, and be with his soldiers and be identified. And we've got another fellow who sits at a 30 metre long table um, you know, with people at the other end in case he you know, gets, a, gets a dose of COVID. Yeah, OK. Let me take you to the subject of drones. You, you, you've spoken a, a fair bit about that. Uh, I'm interested in, you know, what we're learning about drones and potentially what the crossover is into other domains. Uh, and I'll, I'll pick agriculture uh, as an example, but there is, there is scope for, for many others as well. Uh, in terms of innovation, uh, you know, the whole learning cycle and adaption cycle, um, you know, you know, what, what, what are the opportunities um, you're seeing, particularly with drones or anything else that's, that we're seeing mm. um, in Ukraine? Yeah, huge question, and, and I'm conscious that I'm in the presence of the chair of the, uh, of the, of the Autonomous Systems CRC, so um, he knows far more about this than me. Um, firstly, uh, I've used the drone examples um, described there, and in fact the one that you're looking at on the picture is a commercial drone with a 3D printed release mechanism to drop a hand grenade down somebody's, um, you know, shorts while they're uh, cleaning their teeth. Um, but we also saw um, drones being used in the attack on the Muscova, which was the cruiser that was sunk um, in the Black Sea. Our drones uh, buzzed that vessel for two or three days, uh, bringing the crew to a level of fatigue and, and, and um, uh, belief that these were just irritating. Uh, and then in, in the um, screening effect provided the drones, they flew some anti-ship missiles and sunk a, a, a Russian cruiser. Extraordinary achievement. We've also seen Russian uh, surface combatants sunk by um, sea-based drones. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, large, let's call them large model boats that loaded with explosive that, that can find their way through uh, defensive works and ram themselves into the hull of a, of a ship. Um, and we are just as likely to see them emerge soon in the ground domain in terms of their ability to 
have um, sleeper vehicles that can pop up and drive themselves into the side of a, a tank. Horrific, scary stuff. Um, for a country like ours, we, we've got to decide what we can build strategically in this country. We've chosen to have a national shipbuilding endeavour, incredibly expensive and difficult, and, and it appears where we're going to sort of make a go of that. I'm, I'm, I'm much more um, interested to hear how Mr Miles describes our ability to make nuclear submarines in Adelaide. Um, but we can do things like drones. The fourth industrial revolution has allowed us to sort of skip that hundred years of, 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 you know, of iron forges and welding that, that was needed for ships, but we can produce and we do produce some of the best uh, autonomous systems in the world in this country. Now, what we've got to do is, you know, is back those, uh, those organisations, um, you know, help them collaborate and, and put private equity and, and buy enough from our military to, to promote. And what I do think is then we see crossover into other industries. Andrew and I volunteered last year in the wheat harvest in the, when the wheat um, farmers couldn't get labour. The, the two of us went out to help harvest and we, and we just saw immediate things. These, these farmers have amazing digital systems on their tractors that can do AI-based um, weed spraying, but they can't get connectivity with the web. Well, a simple drone like the military takes for granted um, circling overhead, as we, you know, we've discussed a number of times, you know, could, could change the nature of the connectivity of our agricultural industry, for example. Um, dangerous, um, boring and dirty, you know, a drone can do to do better than a human and we all know there's, there's many, many uh, applications like that. I think this is one of the things we can be globally competitive in relatively quickly. Great, great. Okay, look, I'm conscious of time. I know we have to finish just a bit before eight and be out of here by eight. So I'll... I'll pause on my questions and I'll uh, now just go to the audience for any questions of Gus. Uh, I just, so, the, in, so the question was around um, essentially the, the use of mathematical modelling uh, to essentially uh, understand the risks of, of nuclear war. Uh, and so, because clearly we have a mathematician um, with us. Uh, Gus, you got any thoughts on well, that? Well, I thought I might defer to the former head of Army uh, Simulation and Modelling, uh, who, who's sitting on my right. Um, I will let Andrew comment. Um, so the answer is yes, sophisticated models are used um, and um, th recently we've seen in, in my world a, a number of publications about models that have been run over the China-Taiwan scenario um, and, and I've got no doubt those same models are being run by NATO and other things and effectively what they're doing is putting in all as, as many of the variables as they can um, and, and ultimately working out potential casualties etc. In uh, modern digital command and control systems, we also, at a much less sophisticated level, try to build what we call a war game into that process so that there is some intellectual rigour around the analysis. Uh, generally, I think we're, and this is where technology is going more broadly, we match the, the, the tool to then um, experience and judgement and together we, f we think that's going to make better decisions. What will be interesting in the future, we'll have the spies of respective countries. One of their objectives will be to get hold of the modelling tool that their adversary is using, you know, to understand the decision making. I think this is the, this world that we're entering. But um, Andrew, you genuinely is a, an army ex former army expert. So I, I studied uh, military operations research. Um, so that, uh, for mathematicians in the room, you'll know what operations research is about. And yes, look, the the the, the modelling. Uh, and the sophistication of that uh, is significant, but it's highly classified. So, uh, you know, we, we now common people are not likely um, to see that, but uh, clearly um, decision makers um, would, would have access to, you know, what, what the current status of that is. And the reason it's classified is things like the, the armour thickness and the um, accuracy levels of weapon systems, all that is, is built into the code. Um, uh, there, you know, there, there are effectively game, you know, based systems which, which replicate some of that, but not to the level of granularity. So the answer to your question is yes, they do. And, and the good news is they're often worst case things, which I think is important. Um, I'd much rather know the worst possible outcome and make my decision on that basis. So um, next question in the front here. Yeah, okay, so I'll just paraphrase this for those online. Uh, so the, the question is that Gus mentioned uh, we're at stage or phase four, and the question is, you know, what are the subsequent phases and what is likely to be the end phase or one, one of the end phase options? There, th this is the question that all of us are racking our, you know, are, are turning our minds to, and of course there's the Zelensky 
end, and then there's the other end, and I might call it the Macron end, and I, and I might be being unfair to the French president, but I'm just going to put him in two camps. Zelensky is, is working incredibly hard to maintain his narrative and the drumbeat that Ukraine can win and evict Russia from all of its territory. Uh, I don't necessarily disagree with him. I just wonder what the cost to his country and his people will be. But at the moment, it appears that the people of Ukraine are supporting his determination in that regard. And in fact, he may be politically vulnerable if he takes any different stance. So that's one possible outcome. And that's my, sadly, we're still talking about this at Christmas next year, because that's a grind that is not over quickly. I think there is another group of people who are trying to work out uh, what, what we call an off-ramp. So how do you give uh, Putin and Zelensky a, a solution to this problem that allows some level of stepping down, maintaining face, n not putting the future of Europeans at risk of a, of a subsequent Russian activity that they may be emboldened to continue in five or ten years' time? And I think that group would probably say that it is unlikely the pre-2014 um, borders will be resumed, which means ceding the Crimea and a large chunk of the Donbass to an invading uh, neighbouring army. Uh, and, and we can all you know, feel the emotional discomfort with, with forcing that on the Ukrainian people. Had the uh, Ukrainians not been so successful with the counterattack that, that, that really recently occurred, I think we'd be further down that discussion uh, than, than perhaps we are. If we were in this grinding um, attritional fire movement phase still and we hadn't seen uh, the, the Ukrainian success that we saw late in their summer, I think we would be further down this discussion. So Zelensky and his army have bought themselves further time and opportunity for an all-out victory. Um, I'm not going to put weight on which I think is more likely, um, but, but I think for now, particularly the Americans, are still backing Zelensky's opportunity to have a total victory. I think perhaps the, the uh, President of France and the Chancellor of Germany might have a slightly different view. And, and the other factor that's out there is the, is the Putin leadership, um, you know, yet to be confirmed, but you know, the Twitter world is talking today that the, I think the Wall Street Journal is reporting that uh, Putin's uh, terminally ill with cancer. You know, if he was no longer to be the leader, you know, we don't know where that would go, whether we get someone that's more moderate or, or worse. So, yeah, how it, that plays yeah, out, it, we don't know. It appears 75 per cent of the Russian population still support the war. Now, information is controlled. I don't think they know necessarily all the things that are occurring. So, unless he, unless he does fall over ill, I, I don't see a you know, a kind of a, a palace push to get rid of him. I, I think it's unfortunately going to have to be done the hard way. OK, question over on the left here. Uh, the, the question is, uh, given Russia is a nuclear state, you know, w would it uh, uh, be... Sat could it ever be satisfied to lose a war on its doorstep when it's a nuclear power? Uh, and, and sorry, the second part of the question oh, it was the mobilisation question because they can still mobilise so many more people. Uh, you know, how, how, what, how does that factor play into this calculation? Yeah, I'll take the second part first and I'll try and be a bit quicker so we can a answer some questions. But um, I think if full mobilisation appears to be one of Putin's Achilles heels. Otherwise, he would have done it by now. This partial mobilisation, I think, came at some cost. And I think the reality for him in terms of popular support would potentially evaporate. But it is a tool available to him still and would be a significant game changer. Uh, that's a simple reality. The Russians still have acres and acres of old equipment, some of it very old, T-34 tanks from World War II, that if you were just simply brutal attrition army with, with a mobilised force, you put enough of that into the field, it will have an effect. And, and again, this comes partly to my fear for that this is still a very dangerous country to, to, to fight. But I do think there's something that he understands about his own population that may be a step too far. Um, the, 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 the nuclear question is a, it's a huge question. And this, this, there's, there's whole theorists around deterrence and its value. And, and there are certainly many Russian commentators that are potentially right of Putin, scary thought, who are saying, well, we're a nuclear-capable nation. Why wouldn't we use it rather than be defeated? 
Um, and I know those voices are out there because we, you know, we are seeing some of it replayed back to us from their media and other commentators. Um, I, I'm doing some work with Joe Hockey, our former treasurer. Joe's pu publicly said he, he uh, and some of the Washington elites are thinking that there's still a 30% chance that nuclear weapons will be used in Ukraine. I disagree with him. I think it's probably closer to 5%. But even the thought of 5% chance of nuclear war on the continent of Europe is still an extraordinary risk. And that really explains the very careful, measured American response, particularly about just how much support they are giving them. Um, Biden was asked why they're not getting F-16s. They're, they're trying to be just inside that threshold of uh, nuclear retaliation, in my view. Um, and I think they're doing some other things. They've, they've put masses of aircraft into um, a bunch of European bases. And I think the message to, to Putin is we won't retaliate with nuclear weapons, but we'll retaliate with enormous conventional force, things like sinking the, the Baltic Sea Fleet, etc. Uh, so they're trying to increase the stakes against Putin using those that are kind of a, of a layer removed from giving the F-16 straight to to the Ukrainians. But this is a there's a whole theory of you know deterrence research that that is going into this. Um, and God forbid, you know, even the optimist in me says we're only five percent likely to see a nuclear exchange on the continent of Europe. And look, I just I can't resist the comment as a logistician in terms of the mobilisation question. That is a massive logistic challenge, and so far, you know, the, the Russians haven't really demonstrated uh, world's best practice in that space. And I suspect that's one of the other hurdles that uh, that Putin has now realised that actually that that's a really tough gig uh, to to, to, to mobilise, given the what appears to have been the endemic corruption. Uh, and, and lack of systems that have been functioning uh, for them to be able to do that. So even when he wants to do it, it's going to be really hard um, for them. Yeah. The special military operation in inverted commas uh, phase, you know, um, most of those conscripts have come from, you know, ethnic minorities, socially uh, disadvantaged groups, um, and, uh, and, and are largely invisible from that Russian elite. I think full mobilisation brings that you know, in, into the families of Moscow, whole different kettle of fish. So I think I've time for one last question. I, first hand was up the back. Yep. Uh, thank you. Just something old and something new. I, I speak as a historian. Australia has a lot of uh, uh, bearing on this. It was the younger Bragg who developed the sound ranging te techniques that took out the German artillery that permitted the advance in the Hindenburg line that helped contribute to the end of the First World War. Uh, we, we, we anticipated a lot of the current technology in sound ranging and flash spotting. Secondly, I wanted to ask you quickly, uh, in relation to the choices, the alternatives that are going to be part of the defense review next month, uh, what do you see as the particular lessons coming to our defense department, our defense establishment oh, yeah, from um, Ukraine? And I guess related to that, what would be your choices, uh, rising above the army to some extent, not dealing with submarines or with uh, F-35s or B-21s? Uh, where do you see the priorities? Yeah, we're going to need to book the facility for another talk. Um, <laughs> because, it's a, look, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge question. It is important. And I can tell you this analysis going. There's some excellent, if you want to read some uh, fantastic material, um, Chatham House and Rusi have, uh, have published a very good analysis of the lessons learned from the first year of the conflict um, and uh, some outstanding technical analysis of the different capabilities of the two nation of the Western versus uh, Soviet systems. One of the things they, they observed, they were shocked at how many Western chips were, were in the Soviet, uh, the Russian technology, quite shocked at how reliant on Western chips they were. Um, but so for, for some reading separately, and I can, I can shoot this to the society so we can put it in the journal perhaps, uh, some of these articles. Uh, we definitely need to be studying the, the lessons from this for our military. We've got a defence strategic review that uh, the new government has commissioned. Um, I think Mr Miles already has the results of that review on his desk and they're working through it. What does it, what does it mean? Do we, do we modernise our armoured vehicles in the army with this in mind? Uh, or are they now a liability and we need more long range missiles uh, drones and potentially uh, nuclear submarines, although I think I'll be uh, long retired from this discussion before we see uh, any of those soon. 
Um, so huge topic. Uh, the, the other associated question, I think, into Andrew's area of logistics, you know, what is should be our national priority? At the moment, Mr. Miles announced that we can we're contributing to some artillery ammunition that will we will provide the explosive propellant that will be shipped to France to be packed into a projectile to give into the Ukraine. We can't make a complete artillery projectile in this country. We can't make a missile, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the, you know, the days of being able to outsource to this global supply chain, if we wanted more Javelin tomorrow, and by the way, they are firing Australia's entire stock holding of Javelin in two days in the war, we can put our order in all we like. We won't see a missile cross our uh, ports for two to five years. So um, these are all questions that we've got to be asking, and that's why you know Andrew and I uh, are grateful for the opportunity to talk about this because I'm a, I've spent my military career you know looking to preserve Australian democracy. Um, democracy works if people are informed, and we're making the right decisions and asking our politicians the right questions. These are all the right questions to to ask them. Right. Well, thanks very much, Gus. And look, thank you very much for your, uh, the audience for, for being here to listen uh, and take those questions. And I would just hand... I've got the rather daunting task, in fact, a very daunting task, of thanking our two speakers tonight. About, you know, late last year, or towards the second half of last year, we were thinking about, in, in, in the program committee, what were, what were going to be the issues for 2023. And I think even then, we knew... We knew power was, might be one, but the one that we thought about and I started to worry about was the technology and what, what we're learning from that war in Ukraine. And you know, that, was, that was a big question. We, we, we knew that there were these issues, but we didn't know who we could get to, to talk about it. It's very difficult to find the right person to talk. And I thought, well, I'll come back to it in a minute. The, the way Andrew described it was very, very interesting. Now, as it happened, I'd been introduced to Major General retired Gus McLaughlin, um, uh, I think early 2021, maybe 2020. And do you know, I managed to persuade him last year to become a fellow of the Royal Society. So we are extremely lucky, and I think he's probably absolutely unique among fellows of the Royal Society in being a highly decorated, combat-hardened senior officer. So we had the perfect person. Looking back over what um, Gus had done, um, the, the, there, was, the, there were a series of articles that, you know, quoting him where he was leading exercises, Exercise Chong Yu, where he was, um, he was quoted saying, this included a static display of the land 400 CRV boxer, the tiger-armed reconnaissance helicopter, protected mo mobility, light Hawkeye vehicle, an unmanned aerial systems. He really knows this work and he's led it all the time. He, in fact, um, we, we, uh, he agreed to become the chair of an advisory uh, group for a new centre focused on, on cyber security and artificial intelligence at Charles Sturt University. And I learnt with, as we were setting that, that, that up and recruiting a really excellent head, that Gus was able to draw on a, a, a really wide range of people from very different areas, people from the federal police, from the uh, startup communities, and, 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 and find something and, um, and, and manage to get an answer and think it through. And I think that was really, really impressive for me. And I think what you said, Andrew, was really interesting, that we, we've chosen a practitioner. And I think incredibly luckily we've got a practitioner. I mean, as it turns out, he's not just a practitioner, he's a journalist, there he is on the, on the drum tonight. But obviously also a commentator and a, a thinker and an academic of, around these areas. And I must say that my, my own feeling after tonight was that if our military is, is at this level of expertise, but also at the ability to think through the strategic historical context and also to bring that very sharp ethical view to bear, then, then we're pretty lucky. So I do want to thank you both very much indeed. That was, it's been a, a, I think we're very excited. We, we hope that we'll get uh, something in the journal to be based on that and look at us on, on YouTube.